Welcome to the fourth season of Viking Radio Theater. My name is Walter Lutch, I'm the production director, and I'll be your host for this episode. Over the last three years, we have produced over 16 episodes, all while much of our cast and crew work one or two jobs and take full course loads at Western Washington University. Yet each year, we add more and more complexity, depth, creativity, and skill to our work. Whether it's in the form of new events, like the 1940s Mystery Dinner Night and our annual script contest, or creating our own multi-chapter serials that tell stories worthy of your television or streaming service. So I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has participated in Viking Radio Theater from the beginning. Whether it was a bit part in one episode, submitting a script that made its way to air, editing some of the sound effects into a piece, or being a dedicated listener who follows our work. We have another great year of comedy, drama, suspense, and sci-fi ready to go, and many more after. But only because of the hard work of everyone who has come before. If this is your first time tuning in, Viking Radio Theater is a monthly, hour-long program, written, acted, and recorded by the talented students of Western Washington University and our local community. We revitalize the genre of radio theater, utilizing the format to tell modern stories with a style that engages the imagination. So sit back, close your eyes, and let our voices take you on a journey. You can listen to our program here on KMRE 102.3 as part of the Community Playhouse. All of our episodes are also available anytime on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash vikingradiotheater. If you're interested in voice acting, script writing, or sound editing and effects, consider being a part of our show. You can get more details by sending us an email at vikingradiotheater at gmail.com. Starting off this episode, Ethnography, by Julia Rutledge. Recording three of Study Cascadia. It's the 15th day of the third cycle. I'm here with... Well, why don't you say your name? Mary Edens. Marie has agreed to be one of my key informants. Well, when you say agreed... Marie, I can't do this without your permission. I know, I know. I just didn't realize you'd be living in my house. <coughs> When people learn I'm housing the enemy... Argents aren't your enemy. They remained neutral during the colonization. That's why I'm here, to let people know what's been really going on on Earth under Kavoran rule. That's why I said I would do this. I'm just going to get all kinds of flack for it. Flack? You know, crap? People are going to be mad at me. We'll be careful. I hope they'll understand you're just an anthropologist. Terrologist. Same thing. And remind me of your name? <laughs> it's so hard to remember. My name is Tish Canarvalent in Escador. I can't pronounce that. Can I call you Tish? Born Squadron 7, checking in for... This is recording four, sixteenth day of the third cycle. Tell us where we're going, Marie. Can you really not pronounce Mary? Mary. Never mind. Okay, uh, we're walking to the closest distribution center to get food for the week. It's a lot to carry, but I don't want to have to walk ten miles both ways to get food every day. You'd think they could fly it to us or something. Ten miles is nothing when you've got a car, but who has those anymore? The Caborns can teleport it into our houses if they want. And are you getting food just for yourself? No, I, I also get food for old Mrs. Pritchard and her grandson Jacob. He's only three and she can't get around very well. See that sign? Edgar Martinez Drive. He was a baseball player. I don't know if you... People have attempted to explain baseball to me, yes. So that crater there... That used to be Safeco Field, yeah. They bombed CenturyLink, too. My grandma had season tickets. All the grandkids would want to go to games with her. She took me once, and I got to meet Richard Sherman afterwards. But now it's just a radioactive hole. <coughs> Come on, we're about half an hour away from the waterfront. Recording five. We've been in line for about... how long in Earth time, Marie? Twenty minutes or so. We're almost at the front, though. Mmm, can't wait to fill my backpack with protein and fiber packs. There might even be some canned bread if we're lucky. Hey, what's that waiting in line for? You don't need handouts. You own the damn planet. They're not Kavoran, they're Argent. They're doing a sort of expose on what life is like down here. It looks Kavoran to me. Are you blind? Kavorans have four arms, not three. It might have lost it. They're with me, okay? Lay off. Sorry about that. I was afraid this sort of thing might happen. Don't worry. I can take care of myself. You're not gonna hurt anyone, are you? No. It's against the terrologist way. But Argents do have built-in defense mechanisms. Like radiation? Are you shielded from that? <laughs> Yes, there's a lot of background radiation on my planet. Guess what? Now there is here, too. And that's all for the Seattle Area News. Tune in tomorrow for more information on safe spots and food caches. We'll be broadcasting on 103.7, the old mountain frequency. 
Hello, Mary, dear. Oh, who's this? This is Tish, Mrs. Pritchard. They're going to be living with me for a bit while they research post-colonial human life. That's good, right? Yes, Mrs. Pritchard. I picked up your food, and a nice Kevoran lady gave me some anti-radiation pills. I thought they might help you and Jacob. (coughs) Oh, no, dear. You need those as much as we do. Please, Mrs. Pritchard. They might help you from catching something else. You've been boiling your water, right? Oh, yes. Good. I'll be around again in a few days. Send Jacob over if you need anything. Thank you so much, Mary. Goodbye. Bye. God, did you see her face? Did you see her... God, she looks just like Emma did. I'd give her a month at most. F me. We're running out of places to bury people. God, I'm so tired. (sighs) Recording six. It is nighttime now. Marie went to sleep almost immediately after we got back to her house. Her cough is getting a lot worse than when I first met her. I may lose my first human informant before we've even begun. Some of my Cavoran informants work in government-run hospitals. The nearest one is twenty miles away. That is a long way for a human to walk. If things got really drastic, I could arrange transport, but that would be interfering to the highest degree. Overall, what I've seen of the human condition is deplorable. Nothing can be grown in the soil saturated by radiation, and they must depend on food provided to them by the colonizing force. Revnikolakis and Matralentar's study proved that the effect of the hydrogen bombs will have consequences for many years to come. They studied the soil and plant life, but what we're seeing here is the human impact. The population that the Kavorans wanted to utilize is a fraction of its original size, and many of the survivors will not live much longer. Yeah, this is Clark. No, I got a hold of a ham radio. I know. Hey, any news on a resistance group? Got something on a pirate station? Yeah, let me write it down. Hold on, hold on. Okay. FM-1000? All right. Recording 9 of the Cascadia study. It's the 20th day of the third cycle. I thought I'd show you the fine art of looting today. There's an industrial park not far from my neighborhood where some good stuff can still be found. All the food was taken months ago, but there's still a lot of good electrical stuff. Do you worry about your house being looted? No, there's a system in place. We all agree not to rob each other, basically, and if any outsiders come snooping around, we all band together to fight them off. How large is the neighborhood? Uh, this development we're in is only about 200 houses. I think Clark did the math once. It was like two people on average per street or something. Yeah, sounds about right, since on my street there's only me, Mrs. Pritchard, and Jacob. There are only about two houses left per block. The shockwave instantly collapsed most buildings. This was the shockwave from the bombs dropped on Seattle. That's the one. Here we are. The industrial park? Yep. Something's wrong. What? Somebody's here. How can you tell? That car. That car wasn't there before. Who the hell has a car? Come on. Marie, is this safe? Shh! Someone's coming out of that office. Get down! It's a man. Jeez, he's got an assault rifle. I guess the Gavorans didn't manage to take all the guns away. This isn't good. He's got a car and a gun. What is he, some kind of agent? For the Kavorans or the humans, do you think? I don't know. Maybe he... (coughs) Hey. He saw us. (coughs) I know. Is that a Kavoran? Oh, God. Get down on the ground, both of you. We are unarmed. On the ground, now. I just wanted some batteries. I'm sorry if this is your turf. What the hell are you doing with a Kavoran? Are you a spy? No, they're an Arjit. They're learning what it's like here. Have you been to this complex before? Yeah, lots of times. I've never seen anyone else. You better get out of here and not come back, lady. There's going to be a lot of people like me around here from now on. If you lead anyone to us... Are you some kind of resistance force? (laughs) You think I'd tell you if we were? I could help you. I'm good with electronics. If you've got an internet router, I can make it work. At home, I hooked up a computer to a satellite dish. It gets Kavoran signals sometimes. Just get out of here, okay? Is that a ship? Oh, no. You led the Kavorans to us. We didn't, I swear. Oh, hell, that was our communications building. They knew exactly where to bomb. They must have already known about you. Marie, we should go. You're right. Is that your car we saw? So what if it is? If it is, Brainless, we can get in it and get the frick out of here. Humans stick together. Run! Are you still recording, Tish? You getting all this? Get in, quick. There's a safe house a little ways from here. 
Is it anywhere near Schmidt's Park? It'd be a little bit out of the way, but... Great, you can drop us off near there. What? If you do, I'll give you the signal booster I've been working on. Kind of like a mini cell tower, you know? Have you got a cell phone? Yeah. I thought you might. And if you guys ever need help with any wiring, you can hit me up. Why help? Are you kidding? A resistance against the Kaborns? I've been trying to find one for months, since right after the first attacks. That was probably the last of the complex. Damn. Were you the only one there? Yeah, that's something at least. At least they didn't follow us. Nah, we're not important enough. Okay, we're coming up to Schmidt's Park. Turn down 49th. It's the Blue House. Oh. Is that Jacob? Yeah, what's he doing in the street? Jacob? Grandma! Grandma won't wake up! You're gonna be okay, Jacob. Stay here with Tish and, uh... David. Stay here with Tish and David. I'll be right back. Hey, Jacob. Are you an alien? Yeah. Are you a bad guy? No. I'm one of the good aliens. Is Grandma gonna be okay? Do you have a mom, kid? Mommy went away. <sighs> Grandma's gonna have to go away too, little bro. Oh. Marie? I have to go get a shovel. Can you put some food and clothes in a bag for me? Um, yes. The signal booster's in on the kitchen table, David. Uh, Marie, where are we going? I'm taking Jacob and joining the revolution, Tish. You can come with us if you want. I feel... I feel like I should. We'd be happy to have you. Viva la revolution! Liberté, égalité, fraternité, and all that. To whoever's listening out there, I'm broadcasting this on all Argent frequencies I know. Hopefully somebody will get this and let my people know. My name is Tishkin Arvalantin Askador. I'm a terologist conducting a study on Earth in the Pacific Northwest region of America. Almost immediately after I arrived here, it became apparent to me that the humans here are suffering drastically. My informant and I located a resistance movement that we intend to join. In all likelihood, this will be my last contact with my people for a long time. Although the way of the terologist is to remain impartial, this is one cause I feel is worth fighting for. The End That was Ethnography by Julia Rutledge. Tish was played by Quentin Fagerly. Mary was played by Julia Rutledge. The Soldier was played by Adam Kane. The Woman and Mrs. Pritchard were played by Naomi Gish. The Pirate Radio Host was played by Walter Lutch. Clark was played by J.J. Mueller. David was played by Martin Chase. And Jacob was played by Griffin Patterson. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. Hey there! How often has this happened to you? You get the nicest darn gift from someone and realize you don't have enough time, consideration, or self-awareness to write them a thank you card? Well, do I have the solution for you? My name is Theo and I'm here to say thanks with the Thanks Theo Human Thank You Card Program. All that troublesome work of writing a note, getting an envelope and a stamp, and sending it out will be a thing of the past. Here's how it works. Just give me a call. Tell me whom to thank and where, mail me, and then I'm on my way to send them your regards for just a small fee per thank, plus shipping and postage. What a time saver! I can squeeze into box sizes of 3 by 3 square feet or bigger. My chiropractor calls me an anomaly. Thanks, Dr. Schneider! For legal reasons, kisses on the forehead and kicks in the shins are not allowed as part of the human thank you card program but I can give a super smile and the biggest darn thumbs up you've ever seen for a small additional cost. Got someone to thank in Kirkland, Kentucky, or Kenya? You can ship me all over the world, even to Antarctica. Forget phone calls and emails, they can't say thanks the way a bald hundred pound stranger can. When the job's done, you'll be saying thanks, Theo. But don't worry. There's no need to send me a thank you card afterward. I'll just say it to myself later. Thanks for listening! You're listening to Viking Radio Theater on KMRE 102.3. I'm proud to announce that our next episode will feature the first chapter of our newest serial. We'll be taking to the high seas with the first part of The Corsair's Liberation in the latter half of next month's episode. But first, we'll visit the afterlife with No Good Deed by Mitchell Parker. Uh, hello? Is anyone in here? Yo, over here. Take a seat. 
Can you tell me where I am? I'm trying to remember, but everything's a little、uh, hazy. And who are you? Why is this place? Hold up. Let's just handle the first two for now. As for where you are, you would probably say that you're in that lovely little bistro on Eighth and Main. Whereas I would probably say that、uh, you're lying in an alley, stabbed and bleeding to death. As for who? Bleeding to death? What are you talking about? Ah、uh, ah、uh, ah!、Uh, one at a time. As for who I am, well, if you're dying, then I must be. Death. Bingo! Got it in one. You know, most people who come through that door take quite a bit longer to put two and two together. Wait, you said I'm bleeding to death. If that's true, why am I in a cafe, and why can't I remember, y- you know, being stabbed? You can't remember being stabbed because blood loss is one hell of a drug. You should be fine in a few moments. And you're in a cafe because I want to have a little talk before you go on to the pearly gates. And standing over two bloody corpses in a dimly lit alleyway isn't the most conducive venue for polite conversation. Two corpses? Yup. You and the jerk who stabbed you. Well, if I was the one that was stabbed, why is he dead too? Because you know what? He died before he passed out. If you just give it a moment, you'll remember. And passed out? Does that mean I'm not dead? Well, no, not yet. But if you're here talking to me, that means the big guy upstairs figured your odds weren't looking too hot. But I'm not dead yet. That means there's a chance, right? <sighs> Kid, I didn't bring you here to play twenty questions about the chances of your survival. Well, then what am I doing here? I already told you. I like to have a little chat with the stiffs before sending them on their way. Apparently, I jumped the gun a bit when it came to you. Huh. All right then.、Uh, let's uh, let's talk. Well, I would. I want to talk about how you died, why you did what you did, and what not. But I've got an amnesia corpse as a conversation partner, so the questions I wanted to ask are gonna have to wait. Huh. So, um. You don't really look like what death should look like, right? Right. Well, I learned pretty quickly after I started doing this whole interview with a dead person thing. A bones and a cloak isn't the most friendly look. So I started taking on appearances that are a bit more familiar to folks. And you're a college student in the Pacific Northwest, so I figured the whole flannel and beanie duo was a safe bet. That's interesting. No, it's really not. Holy, I I did that. So, Mister Hero finally remembers. I mean, I'm no coward, but that what I did was really bri- stupid. What you did was idiocy beyond your mortal ken. Brave. I was gonna say brave. Yeah, and you are, of course, just a little biased. I say that it was stupidity in its purest form. Are you done, or did you just call me in here so you could berate me until I finally died? Depends. Are you done patting yourself on the back? 'Cause if not, I'm just gonna call you stupid again. Okay, you know what? Going to help someone when they scream for help isn't stupidity. It's doing the right thing. No, you're right. Helping someone out, especially in the circumstances which you did, isn't stupid. But rushing headlong into a dark alley, alone, with no idea of the situation, is. So what would you have done? Hmm? Sit back and do nothing? I don't know. Call the cops at least. You didn't even think to reach for your phone, did you? It slipped my mind. You know, in the heat of the moment. And that is what I would call an idiotic mistake. Ergo, if I had taken the time to call someone, it could have been the person I helped sitting in this seat instead of me. Fair point. But you consider that a favorable trade-off? You sitting here instead of them? Yep. Why? Because I chose to run down that alley. I made the conscious decision to risk my safety to help someone out. They didn't get that choice. 
and you ended up getting a conversation with me for your troubles. I didn't say that my decisions didn't have consequences. So you just decide to, to risk your life out of what? The goodness of your own heart? Because I find that a little hard to believe. Well, let's be honest. I wasn't really expecting the guy to pull a knife. All right. So let's say you knew the guy was armed and not just dangerous, but ready to kill. Would you still have rushed in all gung-ho like that? If you say yes... Yeah, I still would have. Still probably wouldn't have even thought to call for backup. See? Any sane individual would call that stupid. They, and I, would say that your head ain't on properly if it wouldn't even cross your mind to call on anyone to help you out. You're a cynical one, aren't you? Kid, you would be too if you had my job. Why is it so hard for you to admit that I might have just done a good thing? Because if you talk to as many stiffs as I have, you learn that no one, no one, does something just because it's the right thing to do. Everyone has their own little ideas and plans. Even the most selfless deed can be born out of selfishness. So excuse me if I don't jump up and down, pat you on the back, and sing your praises from the mountaintops. Yeah, you did a good thing, I'll give you that. But I'll eat my hat if you did it only because it was the right thing to do. Sounds like you got a bit of bias yourself. What? That's why you do this, isn't it? I bet you didn't have a chat with the dude who stabbed me. Of course I didn't. I already know his story. You were the one I was curious about. I don't think curiosity has anything to do with it. I think that I did something good, so you decided to chat me up. And before this went off the little script you probably had planned out, you were going to rake me over the coals trying to find something, anything, that might prove that I didn't do what I did for the right reason. Maybe I have a martyr complex, or the person I saved was a friend, or maybe I just wanted to see my name in the papers. I bet you were going to dig and dig and dig until you found something that let you maintain that depressingly bleak worldview. So, am I wrong? No, I'm not going to lie to your face and tell you you're wrong. It's just, I've, I've uh, never really been dissected like that before. Well, I am a psych major, so... Yeah, that'll do it. So, what are you gonna do now? Show me some ink blots, then tell me that my cynicism comes because my mother withheld her affection during my childhood? <laughs> <laughs> uh, nah, I forgot my ink blots at home. I'm just curious why, you know? Why you do this? Because honestly... I don't think good people exist. What? Yep. I figure that they're either selfish people who realize that it's easier to get what they want by doing good things, or they're idiots who, <laughs> well, you know firsthand, die before they can get anything done. Either way. <laughs> then again, you know, it's never too late to change my mind. Wait, what? Kid, if you're as good of a person as you seem to think that you are, and the world could use a lot more folks like you. And apparently, whatever forces are at work here agree with me on that one. You mean... Yep. The dice have finally landed, and they've landed in your favor. Looks like you get yourself a chance to prove me wrong. I'm... not dead? Nope. Looks like you were lucky this time. So let this be a teachable experience. Maybe don't rush right in next time. Maybe... Uh, I don't know. Use some sense and call for a bit of extra help? Hmm. I wouldn't hold my breath. How did I know you'd say that? Listen, just play it smart. I don't want to see your mug around here for the next few decades at least. Well, I'll try. So, how do I go back? Right through that doorway. Out the way you came in. Now, step through that door and you'll be in a world of hurt. But it's better than if you stick around here for much longer. Kid, one more thing. You've just been given a second chance. And not many people get that. So don't you go wasting it. Didn't plan on it. Oh, and a quick word of advice. I get that they're cheap, but lay off the burgers, alright? 
Maybe have a bowl of Cheerios every once in a while. Because heart disease is the leading cause of death in America, and yay, job security and all, but it'd be pretty sad if you survived this, only to be done in by fast food. <laughs> yeah, good luck. You'll definitely need it. The End. That was No Good Deed by Mitchell Parker. The Young Man was played by Griffin Patterson, and Death was played by Martin Chase. Now for a quick commercial. Okay, now, what do you guys like on your pizza? Hawaiian's always a good fallback. Yeah, I can do Hawaiian. What? Ew. Really? Everybody usually likes Hawaiian. No way. Usually nobody likes Hawaiian. Most everybody I know is okay with it. Really? Almost everyone I know hates it. Well, what about pepperoni? Okay. Yeah, it's too spicy for me. Maybe just cheese? I suppose if we can't come up with anything... Pizza delivery. That's so weird. We were just trying to decide... One large cheese, one large half Hawaiian, half Italian sausage, and black olives. The pizza you will order in approximately 36 minutes. There's no way it would have taken us that long to decide. Wow. I was just thinking about an Italian sausage with black olives. But... Pizza of Prophecy reads the future and begins making the pizzas you're going to decide on so that it's ready at or before the time of your order. That's so cool! Pizza of Prophecy. Delivering the pizza you will eventually decide on. You're listening to Viking Radio Theater on KMRE 102.3. Up next, Visiting Day by Callan Gustafson. Alicia is shown into a prison visiting room and taken to a window by a guard. Sit right here, ma'am. You shouldn't be too long. You'll have an hour to visit, then time's up. Thanks, but I doubt I'll need an hour. Just making sure you know. You'll have to sign out when you're done. All right. Have a good visit. Thanks. The guard leaves, and Alicia sits down. She picks at a loose thread on her jacket impatiently. A few minutes later, a man is led to her window by a guard. He sits down and looks at Alicia in confusion. He picks up the phone. Hello? Hi. Alicia? Surprised you even recognized me. How could I not? I can't believe you're here. Where's Nicole? Did she come too? No. She didn't. I'm sorry. You were so little the last time I saw you. I was nine. I've missed you so much. I can't say the same. I still have all of your letters. Let me tell you, a lot of the people in here are pretty jealous that I got mail. Yeah, got. In the past. You told me your mother wouldn't let you write anymore. Well, that was a lie. Mom didn't stop me. I just didn't want to write anymore. What are you talking about? I stopped writing because I realized that what my family was saying about you was actually true. I told you not to believe what they said. Your mother's whole family has been out to get me since day one. That might have worked when I was nine, but I grew up. What's that supposed to mean? You lied to me. About what? Everything. I didn't find out you were in prison until I was 13. Don't be stupid, Alicia. Can't you just admit you were wrong? I was doing the right thing. How was I supposed to tell my daughter I was being arrested, huh? Do you think it was easy for me? Don't put this on me. You're not the victim here. I lied to protect you. You didn't protect me from anything. You should have told me the truth. I was the last person to know you were in prison. Did you know that? Even the dog knew what happened before I did. Would it have been better if I told you the truth? Really, think about it. How would you have taken it when you were nine if I had told you the truth? That doesn't matter now. Yes, it does. You should be grateful that I tried. I'm a lot better than half the guys in here. Grateful? Grateful? You're not better than anyone else in here. You're a terrible father. That's just your mother talking. I picked you up on time every weekend. I paid child support every month. I was never late. You were a drug dealer. Maybe. But I provided for my family. And what about after you got arrested? Did you even bother to find out how we were doing? You seemed happy in your letters. Mom started drinking again. Did you know that? She knew you were a bad influence on us, but she still loved you after the divorce. She drank away whatever money we had left. We got evicted. Did you even know we were homeless for a few months? But your letters... I... We visited Grandma and Grandpa on the weekends. 
They would send them for me. We finally moved in with them when mom hit rock bottom. I pretty much raised Nicole for a year while mom got clean. If we hadn't had grandma and grandpa, I don't know what would have happened to us. You should have been there for us, but you weren't. Alicia, honey, I had no idea. What could you have done from here, you know, since you were such a good father? But I was. Do you remember when you were little? God, you must have been five, maybe six. It was definitely before the divorce. We went to that park, I forget what it was called, for Fourth of July. Carson Park. Yeah, that one. They had a fireworks show that night, and all you wanted me to do was spin you so the fireworks would look all shaky. I think I spent half the night spinning you. Every time I stopped, you would just reach up and yell, Daddy, make them shake more, so I'd pick you up and keep spinning. Your mother thought I was nuts. Dad. It wasn't all bad. I know it hasn't been great with me locked up, but we can move on, right? I'm up for parole soon, and I'm feeling good about it. I think I've got a great shot of making it. We could... Get lunch or something, just the two of us have a real conversation without a window between us. We could go to Carson Park again, feed the ducks or something. No, we can't. What? I'm not here so you can say sorry. You can never be sorry enough. What else can I say? Come on, Alicia, I want to make this right. You know what you can do to make this right? You can go back in time and decide not to commit armed robbery. You can go back and give me 15 years of my life. You can give Nicole a father she actually remembers. She cried every night for months after you got arrested. Months! She was only four, Dad. The robbery wasn't my idea. It was Dave's. I was just trying to provide for you. Your mom had lost her job. You needed more money. You have an excuse for everything. Loving my daughters is an excuse? If you loved us... You would have cared enough to find out what happened to us after you got arrested. Do you even know what you're doing? This is why I didn't want to come. You're so manipulative. You're nice, then you're angry, then you're nice again. Then you put the blame on me like it was my fault you couldn't get a real job, so I should feel sorry for you. I'm trying to explain myself. You just don't understand. I can't do this anymore. Can't do what? Talk to your father? Why did you come then? To tell me off? I'm getting married. What? You didn't even notice the ring, did you? His name is Nick. The wedding's in four months. That's great, sweetheart. I came to tell you that you're not invited. Not to my wedding, my birthday, Christmas, ever. I don't want to see you again after this. I want you out of my life, for good. But I can do better. I'm a good dad. You know that. I can be a good dad again for you and Nicole. You already destroyed our lives once. I'm not letting you do it again. Just stay away from me. Stay away from us. I should be the one walking you down the aisle. I am your father. No. You're not. Not anymore. Alicia, honey, come on. We can talk about this. Don't leave. There's nothing else to talk about. I know you don't hate me. Yes, I do. Don't say that. I don't want to. I don't want to hate you, Dad, but I do. And I have to do this. For me, for Nicole, for Mom. Please, don't leave. Don't do this. Do you remember? That night at Carson Park, I asked if you were tired, if you couldn't spend me anymore. Do you remember what you said to me? Don't worry, I'm stronger than Superman. And I believed you. You were my hero, Dad. You were for a long time. I'm still that person. I can be that person again. No, you can't. It's too late. Don't try to contact me, or I'll get a restraining order. Goodbye, Dad. Alicia hangs up the phone and gets up. Alicia, come back. Alicia! <laughs> Alicia does not look back as she leaves the visiting room and goes into the waiting area. As she signs out, she realizes she is crying. Are you all right? What? Yes, I'm fine. Are you sure? Yes. You're crying. Was it a bad visit? No. Well, yes. But I'm glad I did it. All right. Will we be seeing you again? No. No, you won't. The End that was Visiting Day by Callan Gustafson. The Guard was played by Adam Kane. Alicia was played by Naomi Gish. Travis was played by Quentin Fagerly. And the narrator 
with J.J. Mueller. And now, a preview we're sure you'll love. Coming to you from XBNZ Television, lick your lips in anticipation for the mid-season finale of Love Doctor. He's got a PhD in love. Love Doctor, he's incurable. He's dying of a broken heart. I think I can kiss it and make it better. Get caught up on the tumultuous events of season 22 with our all-day marathon. Sometimes, tender kisses come back to bite. I'm having a baby. I can deliver it. It's yours! <laughs> ah! Doctor, I think there's a problem with my lips. Would you like me to kiss it and make it better? That's what I was getting at. Yeah. Oh, right. But love, Doctor, why didn't your kisses cure him? Nurse, I understand now. That man is my twin brother. Doctor, there was a multibus pileup on the way to a Sakura 99 concert. We've got 20 people waiting in the ER. I can't do it. That's too many people to kiss. Too many to love. You've never seen the love doctor love quite like this. Put on your chapstick and tune in to XBNZ tonight at 7, 8 central. Doctor, I... I'm in love with you. Patricia, that's the one thing my kisses can't cure. You're listening to Viking Radio Theater on KMRE 102.3. The last story for this episode is Sandstorm by Dwayne Yancey. The place, Mars, before the water ran out. A massive canal project is underway to bring water from the polar ice caps and deep inside the work tunnels, an inspector visits the project minister at her headquarters. Minister. Please, come in. I'm Garzak, from the Inspector General's office. Yes, I know who you are. I've been expecting you. Just like I've been expecting the storm out there. I see. You can go ahead. I'm just watching the storm. Well, we were doing a routine audit and had a few questions about your department's spending practices. It's beautiful, isn't it, in a way? Such pure violence, yet completely natural. And driven by nothing but the wind, which really means it's driven by nothing at all. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Not really, sir. Now, if you'll allow me... I figure it'll be here in about an hour. Maybe less. So you'll need to work fast or we'll be here all night. They're getting more powerful, you realize. I'll be here as long as it takes to get my questions answered. Ask away. Very well. We've noticed certain discrepancies in some of the accounts related to the canal project. See how dark it is? That means it's kicking up a lot of the topsoil, not just the sand. The darker it is, the stronger it is. Not a drop of rain, mind you. It hasn't actually rained here in years. Over the three years since you've been in office, sir, it seems a total of 1.5 million drosmas are unaccounted for. I believe you're mistaken. If our accounting is wrong, we're eager to hear how it should be corrected, but we've double-checked the books. Triple-checked them, even. You're short by 400,000 drosmas. I beg your pardon? It's not 1.5 million, it's more like 1.9 million. I assure you, I keep close watch. By the next time two full moons hang in the sky, the figure will be an even two million. I... I don't understand. So you know about this, then? Of course I do. I'm completely responsible for the diversions. So... so you admit it, then? These irregularities? Nothing irregular at all. Every two moons, when we pay our regular contractors, I siphon off a very precise amount of funding. So you're embezzling, then? Define embezzlement. Look, sir... I'm not here to play games. I'm here to investigate fraud. You want fraud? I'll show you fraud. This whole canal project, that's the fraud. Why are we doing this? Why have we shut down almost every other function of government to dig a ditch all the way from the polar ice cap? I assume that's a rhetorical question. Thousands of Martians are out there right now, digging and digging, working 25 hours a day, suffering in the most horrible conditions, Sand in their eyes, dust in their throats, thinking if we can just get this canal built, then we'll have water again, and then things will go back to the way they were, before the ocean started to dry up, before the rationing began, before any of this trouble started. I had three men last week alone drop dead from dehydration. They literally worked themselves to death. And why? Because we didn't have enough water for all of the workers, 
or because they wanted to be able to tell their children and their children's children that they were the ones who helped save our race. There's your fraud. I'm not following you, but it doesn't matter. I'll be presenting my findings to the Inspector General and she can decide what action to take. There won't be any action. So tell me, where's it gone? Your personal account shows no unusual activity. So whatever you've done with it, I must say, you've hidden it well. Do you know why the Canal Project is a fraud, Garzak? I'm not here to debate politics, sir. Oh, it's too late for that. It's too late for everything. Here, take this. What's this? It's a key to my safe over there. Open it. Go ahead. Open it. I would, but you're closer. And I'd like to watch the storm. It's covering the whole western sky now. The first thing you'll see is a report. The gray one, in the binder, with the stamp on the cover. Top secret. I'll spare you the trouble of reading the whole thing. Report from the Climate Study Council. The rate of evaporation is increasing, Garzak. It's increasing exponentially. An examination of global evaporation rates. We've passed a tipping point, Garzak. There's no way we'll get that canal dug in time. And even if we did, we'd still be too late. The water's going away. The temperatures are falling. Soon there won't be enough liquid water left on this planet to support us anymore. And then there won't be any liquid water left at all. Not that it'll matter much then, because we'll already be gone. Our whole civilization turned to dust, betrayed by our own sickly planet. You'll find a chart on page six that explains it all. There's a lot of math involved, but you seem to be good with numbers. This is... I don't believe this. Neither did I at first. But the numbers don't lie. Neither does the lack of rain. We're drying up and there's nothing any of us can do. This planet has failed us, Garzak. It just wasn't meant to be. But the canal... A good idea if it had worked. But it won't. So why... Why do we keep at it? With all the banners and posters and men working around the clock? Why else? To keep them occupied. Distracted. It's a public safety measure in a way. You don't want that many people to lose hope. Not all at once. You don't know what might happen. So you'd lie to them? Do you want to be the one to tell them the truth? No. But I'm not a minister either. True. So do you want to know what I've been doing with the money? Does it matter? Of course it matters. All those men out there, the workers, the engineers, they think they're trying to save our race. I'm making their dream a reality. How? Libraries, Garzak. I'm building libraries. Underground libraries. We can't save our people, but we can at least save our memories. All our art, our artifacts, the records of all our accomplishments. I'm storing them all, deep down, safe from the storms. But why? Why else? Maybe we're the only ones in this universe, Garzak. Or maybe not. Perhaps someday somebody out there will come here and find them and open them. And even though we'll be long gone, they'll know that we were here. And if they know we once lived, well, maybe then we won't have all died in vain. I... I don't know what to say. Of course you don't. No one does. So we keep doing what we've been doing. I... I had no idea it was so bad. Sorry to get sentimental on you, Garzak. I know you accountant types aren't very sentimental. Actually, I'm not either. I think I'm being quite practical. More practical than those fools who want to go build a giant pyramid with a face on it. Complete waste of money. In a couple millennia, the wing will have worn that thing down so it just looks like any other rock formation. Nobody will know what it meant anyway. So how long do we have? A few years at most, probably. It's hard to say. Once things start changing, they have a way of speeding up. The cascade effect, I believe it's called. Reminds me of the waterfall we used to have up in the mountains. I used to go hiking there when I was young. You could hear the roar of the water before you even got there. Just this constant roar off in the distance. It was hard to believe running water could make that much noise. Of course, it's long gone now. I went up there last year. So much sand had blown in, you could scarcely make out where the channels had been. I... I should be going. I should beat the storm. Why bother? Come here, let me show you something else. What's that? 
the last pure water from Lake Kronos before it dried up. I was thinking of saving it for a special occasion, but I think this might qualify. Let's say we have some now. Oh, I, I couldn't. Oh, don't worry. I've saved a few bottles for posterity. To posterity. To posterity. The end. That was Sandstorm by Dwayne Yancey. The inspector was played by J.J. Mueller. The minister was played by Brianna White. And the narrator was Wyatt Chapman. Our fourth season has just begun. But don't forget that if you can't wait for our next episode to come out, you can listen to all of our past shows and gag commercials at any time on our YouTube channel. Just visit youtube.com slash vikingradiotheater. Follow the behind the scenes and makings of the show on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash vikingradiotheater. The writers who contributed to this episode were Julia Rutledge, Mitchell Parker, Callan Gustafson, and Dwayne Yancey. Our chief sound engineer is Wyatt Chapman, and Viking Radio Theater's theme music was written and composed by Kent Miller. From the cast and crew of Viking Radio Theater, thanks for listening.